let's read this. Okay, so we're actually going to start Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. Um, it is one of the important pieces in a literature movement called the Southern Gothic. Basically, the concept with the Southern Gothic is that it takes some horrible things that happen every day, normal, not pleasant things, and just tries to sort of add them in as if it's not really a big deal. Uh, American Horror Story is definitely, even though not all of them take place in the South, but that genre of film is definitely Southern Gothic. Uh, Poe is actually one of the first people to really jump on the bandwagon. He's kind of considered the beginning of uh, the Southern Gothic. He was early 1800s. Um, William Faulkner, who wrote As I Lay Dying, the piece that we're going to read, he came along much later, uh, very late 1800s he was born, and so he wrote, you know, early 1900s time period. It's something I think you will enjoy. This particular piece is written in Stream of Consciousness, uh, where each person, each narrator, has, you know, their own unique voice, their own unique perspective. So this is going to be a different type of reading than what we've done before in a novel setting. It's not your traditional chapter one, I went to the store, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's not like that. It's set up where each chapter has a different speaker, and that chapter is actually titled the speaker's name. So there aren't um, numbers, per se, for the chapters, but, you know, we'll be able to figure out how to navigate within there fairly easily. So I just want to jump on in, okay? The, um, this is what we're looking at, and the first chapter actually starts out um, where the one of the kids of this lady that's dying, it starts narrating. Now, basically the concept is this woman is dying and the, the or is dead, and the family is taking her body to its final resting place. This is quite creepy, but at the same time, they're you know carrying out what what her wishes are. Now, in order to make things a little easier for you to remember, there is a film out there called As I Lay Dying, and we are going to watch pieces of it. And it was written by the brilliant James Franco, or directed by the brilliant James Franco. Um, seems like a odd person to choose to do that, but definitely was. And so I made little uh, hand posters, I guess you could say, to kind of keep us on track as to what it is that's actually happening. And so you can sort of put a name to a face while we're reading. So this very first chapter, you'll see it's titled Darl. Okay, and that's what it looks like. Um, every chapter will have a different person's name. So here we go, you ready? Here's Darl. Oh, I, it's backwards. Oh, I don't know how to fix that. I'm too dumb. Anyway, there it is. Maybe you can read backwards. Practice that. Okay. Jewel and I come up from the field, following the path in single file. Although I'm 15 feet ahead of him, him, Jewel, that sounds like a girl name, but not in this case, boy name. Anyone watching from watching us from the cotton house can see Jewel's frayed and broken straw hat, a full head above my own. The path runs straight as a plumb line, worn smooth by feet and baked brick hard by July beneath the green rows of laid by cotton to the cotton house in the center of the field where it turns and circles the cotton house at four soft right angles and goes on across the field again, worn so by feet in fading precision. The cotton house is of rough logs, from between which the chinking has long fallen. Square, with a broken roof set at a single pitch, it leans in empty and shimmering dilapidation in the sunlight. A single broad window and two opposite walls, giving onto the approaches of the path. When we reach it, I turn and follow the path which circles the house. Jewel, fifteen feet behind me, looking straight ahead, steps in a single stride through the window. Still staring straight ahead, his pale eyes look like wood set into his wooden face. He crosses the floor in four strides with the rigid gravity of a cigar store Indian, dressed in patched overalls and endued with life from the hips down, and steps in a single stride through the opposite window, 
and then to the path again just as I come around the corner. In single file and five feet apart, and Jewel now in front, we go on up the path toward the foot of the bluff. Tull's wagon stands behind, beside the spring, hitched to the rail, the reins wrapped about the seat's stanchion. In the wagon bed are two chairs. Jewel stops at the spring and takes the gourd from the willow branch and drinks. I pass him and mount the path, beginning to hear Cassius saw. When I reach the top, he's quit sawing. Standing in a litter of chips, he's fitting two of the boards together. Between the shadow spaces, they are yellow as gold, like soft gold, bearing on their flanks in smooth undulations the marks of the adze blade, a good carpenter, Cassius. He holds the two planks on the trestle, fitted along the edge and a quarter along the edges. Sorry, I'm getting there. And a quarter of the finished box. He kneels and squints along the edge of them. Then he lowers them and takes up the ads. A good carpenter. Addie Bundren could not want a better one. A better box to lie in. It will give her confidence and comfort. I go on to the house, followed by the chuck. Of the ads. These are the sounds of Cash, another son, building his mother's coffin. Creepy! Can you imagine listening to that all day? Mm -mm. No, thank you. Okay, the next chapter is narrated by Cora, and Cora is their neighbor, um, and the wife of a guy named Vernon Tull, okay? So she would be Cora Tull. Ready? So I saved out the eggs and baked yesterday. The cakes turned out right well. We depend a lot on our chickens. They are good layers, what few we have left after the possums and such. Snakes, too, in the summer. A snake will break up a hen house quicker than anything. So after they were going to cost so much more than Mr. Toll thought, and after I promised that the difference in the number of eggs would make it up, I had to be more careful than ever, because it was on my final say-so we took them. We could have stocked cheaper chickens, but I gave my promise, as Miss Lawington said when she advised me to get a good breed, because Mr. Toll himself admits that a good breed of cows or hogs pays in the long run. So we lost so many of them, we couldn't afford to use the eggs ourselves because I could not have had Mr. Toll chide me when it was on my say-so we took them. So, when Miss Lawington told me about the cakes, I thought that I could bake them and earn enough at one time to increase the net value of the flock, the equivalent of two head, and that by saving the eggs out one at a time, even the eggs wouldn't be costing anything. And that week they laid so well that I not only saved out enough eggs above what we had engaged to sell to bake the cakes with, I had saved enough so that the flour and the sugar and the stove wood would not be costing anything. So I baked yesterday. More careful than ever, I baked in my life. And the cakes turned out right well. But when we got to town this morning, Miss Longton told me the lady had changed her mind and was not going to have the party after all. She ought to have taken those cakes anyway, Kate says. Well, I say, I reckon she never had no use for them now. She ought to take them, Kate says, but those rich town ladies can change their minds. Poor folks can't. Riches is nothing in the face of the Lord, for he can see into the heart. Maybe I can sell them at the bazaar Saturday, I say. They turn out real well. You can't get two dollars a piece for them, Kate says. Well, it isn't like they cost me anything, I say. I saved them out and swapped a dozen of them for the sugar and flour. It isn't like the cakes cost me anything. As Mr. Tull himself realizes that the eggs I saved were over and beyond what we had engaged to sell. So it was like we had found the eggs, or so they had been given to us. She ought to take in those cakes when she, when she same as gave her, you her, uh, when she same as gave you her word, Kate says. The Lord can see into the heart. If it is his will that some folks has different ideas of honesty from other folks, it's not my place to question his decree. I reckon she never had any use for them, I say. They turned out real well, too. 
The quilt is drawn up to her chin, hot as it is, with only her two hands and her face outside. She's propped on the pillow with her head raised so she can see out the window. And we can hear him every time he takes up the ads or the saw. If we were deaf, we could almost watch her face and hear him, see him. Her face is wasted away so that the bones draw just under the skin in white lines. Her eyes are like two candles when you watch them gutter down into the sockets of iron candlesticks. But the eternal and the everlasting salvation and grace is not upon her. They turned out real nice, I say, but not like the cakes Addie used to bake. You can see that girl's washing and ironing in the pillow slip if it ironed it ever was. Maybe it will reveal her blindness to her, laying there at the mercy and ministration of four men and a tomboy girl. There's not a woman in this section could ever bake with Addie Bundren, I say. First thing we know, she'll be up and baking again, and then we won't have any sale for ours at all. Under the quilt, she makes no more of a hump than a rail would, and the only way you can tell she's breathing is by the sound of the mattress shucks. Even the hair at her cheek does not move, even with that girl standing right over her, fanning her with the fan. While we watch, she swaps the fan to the other hand without stopping it. Is she sleeping, Kate whispers? She's just watching Cash yonder, the girl said. We can hear the saw and the board. It sounds like snoring. Eula turns on the trunk and looks out the window. Her necklace looks real nice with her red hat. You wouldn't think it only cost 25 cents. She ought to take in those cakes, Kate says. I could have used the money real well. But it's not like they cost me anything except the baking. I can tell them that anybody is likely to make a miscue, but it's not all of them that can get out of it without loss, I can tell him. It's not everybody can eat their mistakes, I can tell him. Someone comes through the hall. It's Darl. He does not look in as he passes the door. Eula watches him as he goes on and passes from sight again toward the back. Her hand rises and touches her beads lightly, and then her hair. When she finds me watching her, her eyes go blank. So this lady's like super religious, right? She's kind of snooty, it sounds like. She's, she tries really hard to be friendly, you know, and, and she, she wants to make sure that, okay, well, this is great. Yeah, it's okay that I busted my booty and I did all this work. If God's will, then it's fine. So remember... Neighbor lady, try to be helpful. Okay, next chapter. Again, we're back to Darl. Cute little James Franco. Okay. Pa and Vernon are sitting on the back porch. Pa is tilting snuff from the lid of his snuff box into his lower lip, holding the lip outdrawn between thumb and finger. They look around as I cross the porch and dip the gourd into the water bucket and drink. Where's Jewel? Paul said, pa says, when I was a boy, I first learned how much better water tastes when it has, a set, has set a while in a cedar bucket, warmish, cool, with a faint taste like the hot July wind and cedar tree smells. It has to set at least six hours and be drunk from a gourd. Water should never be drunk from metal. And at night, it is better still. I used to lie on the pallet in the hall, waiting until I could hear them all asleep so I could get up and go back to the bucket. It would be black, the shelf black, the steel surface of the water around orifice and nothingness, where before I stirred it awake with the dipper, I could see maybe a star or two in the bucket, and maybe in the dipper, a star or two before I drank. After that, I was bigger, older. Then I would wait until they all went to sleep so I could lie with my shirt tail up, hearing them asleep, feeling myself without touching myself. Hmm. Feeling the cool silence blowing upon my parts. I'm wondering if Cash was yonder in the darkness doing it too. Had been doing it perhaps for the last two years. Before I could have wanted to or could have. Sounds a little odd. It's okay. Keep going. Pa's feet are badly, badly splayed. His toes cramped and bent and warped with no toenail at all on his little toes. From working so hard in the wet homemade shoes when he was a boy. Beside his chair, his brogans sit. They look as though they had been hacked with a blunt axe out of pig iron. Vernon has been to town, 
Remember, he's the neighbor. I've never seen him go to town in overalls. His wife, they say. She taught school to once. I fling the... Ah! Where are you going? Get back over there. Get over there. You stay there. Good gracious. I fling the dipper dregs to the ground and wipe my mouth on my sleeve. It's going to rain before morning. Maybe before dark. Down to the barn, I say, harnessing the team. Down there, fooling with that horse. He will go on through the barn into the pasture. The horse will not be in sight. He's up there among the pine seedlings in the cool. Jewel whistles once and shrill. The horse snorts. Then Jewel sees him, glinting for a gaudy instant among the blue shadows. Jewel whistles again. The horse comes dropping down the slope, stiff-legged, his ears cocking and flicking, his mismatched eyes rolling, and fetches up 20 feet away. Broadside on, watching Jewel over his shoulder in an attitude, kittenish and alert. Come here, sir, Jewel says. He moves. Moving that quick, his coat, bunching, tongue swirling like so many flames. With tossing mane and tail and rolling eye, the horse makes another short, curveting rush and stops again, feet bunched, watching Jewel. Jewel walks steadily toward him, his hands at his sides. Save for Jewel's legs, they are like two figures carved for a tableau savage in the sun. When Jewel can almost touch him, the horse stands on his hind legs and slashes down at Jewel. That's not a nice horsey, bad horsey. Then Jewel is enclosed by a glittering maze of hooves, as by an illusion of wings. Among them, beneath the upreared chest, he moves with the flashing limberness of a snake. For an instant, before the jerk comes onto his arms, he sees his whole body earth-free, horizontal, whipping snake limber until he finds the horse's nostrils and touches earth again. Then they are rigid, motionless, terrific, the horse back thrust on stiffened, quivering legs with lowered head. Jewel with dug heels shutting off the horse's wind with one hand, with the other patting the horse's neck in short strokes, myriad and caressing, cursing the horse with obscene ferocity. He's ticked because the horse is acting up like a fool. They stand in rigid, terrific hiatus, the horse trembling and groaning. Then Jewel is on the horse's back. He flows upward in a stooping swirl like the lash of, his wh of a whip. His body in midair shaped to the horse. For another moment, the horse stands spra spraddled with lowered head before it bursts into motion. They descend the hill in a series of spine-jolting jumps, jewel high, leech-like on the withers, to the fence where the horse bunches to a scuttering halt again. Well, Jewel says, you can quit now if you got a plenty. Inside the barn, Jewel slides running to the ground before the horse stops. The horse enters the stall, Jewel following. Without looking back, the horse kicks at him, slamming a single hoof into the wall with a pistol-like report. Jewel kicks him in the stomach. The horse arches his neck back, crop toothed. Jewel strikes him across the face with his fist and slides to the trough and mounts upon it. Clinging to the hay rack, he lowers his head and peers out across the stall tops and through the doorway. The path is empty. From here, he cannot even hear Cash sawing. He reaches up and drags down hay in a hurried armsfuls and crams it into the rack. Eat, he says. Get the goddamn stuff out of sight while you got a chance. You puzzle gutted bastard. Sweet son of a bitch, he says. Well, that doesn't sound very nice. Now, Jewel, he's, his personality is a lot like the horses. He's um, cantankerous, uh, untamed, kind of violent. Okay, uh, so, so that's kind of important because particularly considering animals usually sort of mimic your behavior. So, makes sense. Okay, now the next chapters, see, it's very short, but this one's read by Jewel. And so, I shall get my, this is Jewel. Um, notice he's uh, the third son. He's younger than Darl. Okay, so this is the one that was just in there with the horse that was acting a fool. And this is the one that narrated that part. But now we're going to hear from, actually from Jewel himself. Okay? Okay. Put that there so you can see him. You don't really need to see me anyway. 
It's because he stays out there, right under the window, hammering and sawing on that goddamn box where she's got to see him, where every breath she draws is full of his knocking and sawing, where she can see him saying, See? See what a good one I'm making for you? I told him to go somewhere else. I said, Good God, do you want to see her in it? It's like when he was a little boy, and he says if he had some fertilizer, she would try to raise some flowers. And he'd taken the bread pan and brought it back from the barn full of dung. And now the mother's sitting there like buzzards, waiting, fanning themselves. Because I said if you wouldn't keep on sawing and nailing at it until a man can't sleep even, and her hands laying on the quilt like the two of them roots dug up, and tried to wash and you couldn't get them clean. I can see the fan on Dewey Dell's arm. I said, if you just let her alone, sawing and knocking and keeping the air always moving so fast on her face that when you're tired, you can't breathe it. And that goddamn ant's going one lick less, one lick less, one lick less until everybody that passes in the road will have to stop and see it and say, what a fine carpenter he is. If it had just been me when Cash fell off that church and if it had just been me when Pa laid sick with that load of wood fell on him, it would not be a happening with every bastard in the county coming in to stare at her. Because if there is a God, what the hell is he for? It would just be me and her on a high hill and me rolling the rocks down the hill at their faces, picking them up and throwing them down the hill, faces and teeth and all, by God, until she was quiet. And not that goddamn ants going one lick less. One lick less. And we could be quiet. He's cranky britches. I don't know what his problem is at this point in the book, but he's fussy, right? So he doesn't, he's sick of hearing all the banging on this coffin. I mean, what a thing to complain about. Gosh, gotta make that coffin so loud. And everybody's like, oh, you're such a great carpenter. Woo -woo. Come on, get over it. Maybe a little brotherly jealousy. I don't know, but he's pretty fussy. Okay, what we got next? Oh, we're back to Darl again. Darl is our cute little James Franco. You'll notice though he does look a little disheveled here. In this particular picture, he's even kind of got a little black eye. Interesting. We watch him come around the corner and mount the steps. He does not look at us. You ready, he says. If you're hitched up, I say. I say, wait. He stops looking at Pa. Vernon spits without moving. He spits with decorous and deliberate precision into the pocked dust below the porch. Pa rubs his hand slowly on his knees. He's gazing out beyond the crest of the bluff, out across the land. Jewel watches him a moment. Then he goes on to the pail and drinks again. I mislike undecision as much as error man, Pa says. It means three dollars. I say. The shirt across Pa's hump is faded lighter than the rest of it. There's no sweat stain on his shirt. I've never seen a sweat stain on his shirt. He was sick once from working in the sun when he was 22 years old, and he tells people that if he ever sweats, he will die. I suppose he believes it. I know some people like that, too. They're not my friends. But if she don't last until you get back, he says, she will be disappointed. Vernon spits into the dust, but it will be rain before morning. She's counted on it, Pa says. She'll want to start right away. I know her. I promised her I'd keep the team here and ready, and she's counting on it. We'll need that three dollars then, sure, I say. He gazes out over the land, rubbing his hands on his knees. Since he lost his teeth, his mouth collapses in slow repetition when he dips. Yuck, yuck. The stubble gives his lower face that appearance that old dogs have. You'd better make up your mind soon so we can get there and get a load on before dark, I say. Ma ain't that sick, Jules says. Shut up, Darl. That's right, Vernon says. She seems more like herself today than she has in a week. Time you and Jules get back, she'll be setting up. You ought to know, Jules says. You've been here often enough looking at her. You or your folks. Vernon looks at him. Jules' eyes look like pale wood in his high-blooded face. He's a head taller than any of the rest of us always was. 
I told him that's why Ma always whipped him and petted him more. Because he was peekling around the house more. That's why she named him Jewel, I told him. Shut up, Jewel, Pa says, but as though he's not listening much. He gazes out across the land, rubbing his knees. You could borrow the loan of Vernon's team and we could catch up with you, I say, if she didn't wait for us. Gosh, shut your goddamn mouth, Jewel says. She'll want to go in arm, Pa says. He rubs his knees. Don't air a man miss like it more. Now, Pa, he's there too. That's going to be... This is what Pa looks like, just kind of to give you. He's fussy too. His name is Ants. Like ants in your pants. Okay? It's laying there washing cash. Whittle on that damn, Jewel says. He says it harshly, savagely, but he does not say the word. Like a little boy in the dark to flail his courage and suddenly aghast into silence by his own noise. She wanted that like she wants to go in her own wagon, Pa says. She'll rest easier for knowing it's a good one and private. She was ever a private woman. You know it well. Then let it be private, Jewel says. But how the hell can you expect it to be? He looks at the back of Pa's head. His eyes like pale wooden eyes. Show, Vernon says. She'll hold on till it's finished. She'll hold on till everything's ready. Till her own good time. And with the roads like they are now, it won't take you no time to get her into town. It's fixing up to rain, Pa says. I'm a luckless man I have ever been. He rubs his hands on his knees. It's that darn doctor liable to come at any time. I couldn't get word to him till so late. If he was to come tomorrow and tell her the time was nigh, she wouldn't wait. I know her. Wagon or no wagon, she wouldn't wait. Then she'd be upset, and I wouldn't upset her for the living world. With that family burying ground in Jefferson, and them of her blood waiting for her there, she'll be impatient. I promised my word me and the boys would get her there quick as mules could walk it, so she could rest quiet. He rubs his hands on his knees. No man ever misliked it more. If everybody wasn't burning hell to get her there, Jewel says in that harsh, savage voice, with cash all day long, right under the window, hamming and sawing at that, it was her wish, Pa says. You got no affection nor gentleness for her. You never have. We would be beholden to no man, he says, me and her. We have never yet been, and she will rest quieter for knowing it, for knowing it and that it was her own blood sawed out the boards and drove the nails. She was ever one to clean up after herself. My children are home, and it sounds like a party. Okay, well, I'm going to keep reading, see how long we can make it. It means three dollars, I said. Do you want us to go or not? Pa rubs his knees. We'll be back by tomorrow sundown. Well, Pa says... He looks out over the land, awry haired, mouthing the snuff slowly against his gum. Come on, Jewel says. He goes down the steps. Vernon spits neatly into the dust. By sundown now, Pa says, I would not keep her waiting. Jewel glances back, then he goes on around the house. I enter the hall, hearing the voices before I reach the door. Tilting down a little, oops, sorry, tilting a little down the hill as our house does, a breeze draws through the hall all the time, up slanting. A feather a chance to make that th extra three dollars at the price of his mother's goodbye kiss. A bundering through and through, loving nobody, caring for nothing except how to get something with the least amount of work. Mr. Tull says Darrell asked him to wait. He said Darrell almost begged him on his knees not to force him to leave her in her condition. But nothing would do but Ants and Jewel must make that three dollars. Nobody that knows ants could have expected different, but to think of that boy, that jewel, selling all those years of self-denial and downright partiality. They couldn't fool me. Mr. Tull says Miss Bundren liked jewel the least of all. But I knew better. I knew she was partial to him, to the same quality in him that let her put up with Aunt Bundren when Mr. Tull said she ought to poison him for three dollars, denying his dying mother the goodbye kiss. Why, for the last three weeks, I've been coming over every time I could, coming sometimes when I shouldn't have, neglecting my own family and duties so that somebody would be with her in the last moments and she would not have to face the great unknown 
without one familiar face to give her courage. Not that I deserve credit for it. I'll expect the same for myself. But thank God it will be the faces of my loved kin, my blood and flesh. For in my husband and children, I've been more blessed than most. Trials, though they have been at times. Hmm. Maybe they make too much noise when they come in the house. I don't know. She lived a lonely woman, lonely with her pride, trying to make folks believe different, hiding the fact that they just suffered her because she was not cold in the coffin before they were carting her 40 miles away to bury her, flouting the will of God to do it, refusing to let her lie in the same earth with those bundrens. But she wanted to go, Mr. Toll said. It was her own wish to lie among her own people. Then why didn't she go alive, I said. Not one of them would have stopped her, with even that little one almost old enough now to be selfish and stone-hearted like the rest of them. It was her own wish, Mr. Toll said. I heard Aunt say it was. <laughs> you would believe Aunt, of course, I said. A man like you would. Don't tell me. I would believed him about something he couldn't expect to make anything off of me by not telling Mr. Tull said. Don't tell me, I said. A woman's place is with her husband and children, alive or dead. Would you expect me to want to go back to Alabama and leave you when the girls of my time comes? That I left in my own will to cast my lot with yours for better and worse until death and after? Well, folks are different, he said. I should hope so. I've tried to live right in the sight of God and man for the honor and comfort of my Christian husband and the love and respect of my Christian children. So that when I may lay me down in the consciousness of my duty and reward, I will be surrounded by loving faces, carrying the farewell kiss of each of my loved ones into my reward. Not like Addie Bundren dying alone, hiding her pride and her broken heart. Glad to go. Lying there with her head propped up so she could watch Cash building the coffin. Having to watch him so he would not skimp on it, like as not with those men, not like as not with those men not worrying about anything except if there was time to earn another three dollars before the rain come and the river got too high to get across it. Like as not, if they hadn't decided to make that last load, they would have loaded her into the wagon on a quilt and crossed the river first and then stopped and give her time to die what Christian death they would let her. Except Darl. That's him. It was the sweetest thing I ever saw. Sometimes I lose faith in human nature for a time. I'm assailed by doubt. But always the Lord restores my faith and reveals to me his bounteous love for his creatures. Not Jewel, the one she'd always cherish, not him. He was after that three extra dollars. It was Darl, the one that folks say is queer, lazy, pottering about the place no better than ants, with Cash a good carpenter, and always more building than he can get around to, and Jewel always doing something that made some money or got him talked about, and that near-naked girl always standing over Addie with a fan so that every time a body tried to talk to her and cheer her up would answer for her right quick, like she was trying to keep anybody from coming near her at all. It was Darl. He come to the door and stood there, looking at his dying mother. He just looked at her. And I felt the bounteous love of the Lord again, and his mercy. I saw that with Jewel she had just been pretending, but that it was between her and Darl, and the understanding and the true love was. He just looked at her, not even coming in where she could see him and get upset, knowing that Ants was driving him away, and he would never see her again. He said nothing, just looking at her. What you want, Darl, Dewey Dell said, not stopping the fan. Speaking up real quick, keeping even him from her. He didn't answer. He just stood and looked at his dying mother, his heart too full for words. Now, before you get too far in this and you get yourself confused, there's some weird names going on here. We got a brother named Jewel, and I know it sounds like a girl name, but it's not. It's a boy name. Then we got a girl named Dewey Death that sounds like a boy name but she's a girl and that's okay too but let me tell you don't get you're gonna want to say Jewel's a girl and Dewey's a boy but that's not the case Jewel is a boy and Dewey Dale is a girl okay so let's 
but one more chapter. Almost done. We're just going to read from Dewey Dale's. Oh, dear. What is that? Okay. I don't know. Please go away, computer images. Oh, there we are. There's me. Okay. Last one we're going to read today. It's not too long. Dewey Dale. The first time me and Leif picked on down the row, Pa doesn't sweat because he will catch his death from the sickness, so everybody that comes to help us. And Jewel don't care about anything. He's not kin to us and caring. Not care kin. And Cash, like sawing the long, hot, sad, yellow days up into planks and nailing them to something. And Pa thinks because neighbors will always treat one another that way because he's always been too busy letting neighbors do for him to find out. And I did not think that Darrell would, that sits at the supper table with his eyes gone further than the food and the lamp, full of the land dug out of his skull and the holes filled with distance beyond the land. We picked on down the row, the woods getting closer and closer, and the secret shade picking on into the secret shade with my sack and lace sack. Because I said, will I or won't I, when the sack was half full, because I said if the sack is full, when we get to the woods, it won't be me. I said, if it don't mean for me to do it, the sack will not be full, and I will turn up the next row, but if the sack is full, I cannot help it. It will be that I had to do it all the time, and I cannot help it. And we picked on toward the secret shade, and our eyes were drowned together, touching on his hands and my hands, and I didn't say anything. I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm picking into your sack. And so it was full when we came to the end of the row, and I could not help it. And so it was because I could not help it. It was then, and then I saw Darrell, and he knew. He said he knew without the words like he told me that Ma's going to die without words. And I knew he knew because if he had said he knew with the words, I would not have believed that he had been there and saw us. But he said he did know. And I said, are you going to tell Pa? Are you going to kill him? Without the words, I said it. And he said, why? Without the words. And that's why I can talk to him with knowing, with hating, because he knows. He stands in the door looking at her. What do you want, Darl? I say. She's going to die, he says. An old turkey buzzard toll is coming to watch her die, but I can fool them. When is she going to die, I say. Before we get back, he says. Then why are you taking Jewel, I say. I want him to help me load, he says. Now, I'm going to tell you right now this picking down the row, when they get to the woods, the, the idea was they had this basket that they're picking and putting stuff in, and if they got to the end of the row and hers was filled up, then they were going to go have some uh, special time in the woods, Dewey Dell and his late guy. Well, he was picking and sticking it in her basket so that her basket would be full. So when it got to the end, she's like, oh, well, look, my basket is full. And off they go. Has some special time up in the woods. Even with a girl named Dewey. Okay. So that's where we're going to stop for today. We'll get back to it tomorrow.